Right, I'm Ross Aylott. Um, I'm a chemist, so I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm going to get a bit technical. Um, my experience in gin is based on the bulk of my career, the 28 years of my career that I spent in Diageo. Um, so I'm at the, um, the Gordons, Tanqueray, Gilby's, Booth's end of, of the gin world, not the craft world. Um, but I hope what I'm able to tell you about gin on a big scale is beneficial to you and your own ambitions at the moment. So, um, gin distilled in copper pot stills, big copper pot stills. Um, that is uh, Cameron Bridge Gin Distillery, where Gordon's and Tanqueray comes from. Um, what we need to think about today, though, is that gin, in fact, is not simply gin distilling. There are three key elements to the process. To make gin, you need neutral alcohol, um, you need to distill the gin, um, and you need to get it in the bottle for the customer, what I call reduction, packaging, and distribution. So I'm going to talk about all three of those elements. Um, the important bit, obviously, the craft bit, be you on a big scale or on a small scale, is to distill the botanical ingredients in the presence of alcohol and water and produce a gin distillate. That's really what it's all about. But in order to get there, we need to do a number of things. This is a schematic diagram of a big, big gin distill. But essentially, it's doing exactly the same as the, the still that Mark made. Um, it's got a few knobs and whistles on it. So it's got things like a spirit safe here, where the alcohol comes off, and you can measure the alcoholic strength. It's got various valves here, where you can separate the heads, the first distillate from the main gin, from the end of the distillate, the tails. Um, but beyond that, they're all, they're all very similar. So, we have three ingredients that we need to look at. The botanical materials, the neutral alcohol, and the water. But I'm going to start at the front of the process and talk about the neutral alcohol. We need, first of all, a carbohydrate source from which you can produce a beer, which you can then distill and rectify to produce neutral alcohol. There are lots of uh, words in, 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 in the industry, particularly the Scotch whiskey side of the, of the spirits industry, where um, you make a fermented wash and then you distill it. Um, whereas if you're in America, you'd make a beer and then you distill it. Different types of stills. But the still that you require for neutral alcohol is a very, very specific still. You put all those three things together, water, botanicals and neutral alcohol and make a gin, that gives you a high strength gin. It's not produced, you don't produce a, a bottled strength gin, as you well know. You then got to add more water to it and you bring it down to bottling strength and you go through the bottling operation. So there are three, three, three key processes to follow. Let's just think about neutral alcohol production. Various materials have been talked about for neutral alcohol production. By definition, the alcohol must be ethyl alcohol of agricultural origin. That's the key word that you see if you read Regulation 110 of 2008 of the European Union. That's what we've all got to know about. However, that ethyl alcohol of agricultural origin can be made from a whole range of materials. The common one in Britain North America are cereals, wheat, maize, corn in North America, perhaps barley. Molasses is cheaper. That comes a fair bit from Europe. Um, if you were in India, you'd be using extra neutral alcohol, which would be made from molasses. You may use a more expensive source of, of alcohol, perhaps from grapes, but it is used. Potatoes is of greater interest la later, lately. Um, 
And lastly, it's worth mentioning lactose, which is a sugar source from whey. So, for example, neutral alcohol in New Zealand is made from whey, which is a byproduct of their dairy industry. That fermented product needs distilling. And you've heard already today that neutral alcohol, by definition, must be distilled at greater than 96% alcoholic strength. What is neutral alcohol? It's basically ethanol. It's really pure alcohol. And it has very low levels of congeners. Right? You might like to remember the word congener rather than the word impurity. You may think of the congeners in your neutral spirit as impurities that you don't want there. But if you were a whiskey distiller, those congeners are integral to the character of the product. So going through all that process, you end up with neutral alcohol. And you might use a piece of equipment looking like that to get there. That's millions of pounds worth of equipment. That is five distillation columns. And what you're trying to do there is you're taking the, the fermented wash, the beer, in at one end, and you're putting it through all of those columns until out at the end you've got very, very pure, high-strength alcohol. That is neutral alcohol distillation. Now, that alcohol, when being used for gin, has to meet sp the specific requirements of that regulation. Okay? So the first element of quality management in the process is to ensure that your neutral alcohol meets those specs. And that just sits in the annex of that regulation. And what that, those numbers are telling me is that the alcohol has to be distilled up to a certain strength and it has to be rectified, cleaned up to such an extent that all of those other components that you see listed below are below a certain level. And gin rec oh, al neutral alcohol rectifiers easily reach that specification. There's a little bit extra in the regulation 110 that says for London gin, the methanol has to be below 5. We heard that this morning. And um, for London gin, the strength of the, dis the gin distillate has to be at least 70%. They are just two of the elements that got written into the London gin definition that were on top of the gin and the distilled gin definitions. Botanical materials. Well, we all know about that one. It's the juniper. Essential. Can't do without it. Everything else you can have or not have, depending on what you want. So here we see a big long list of the common uh, botanical ingredients that are, that are quoted for, for gin. Um, some people, like many of you here today, like to talk about your botanical ingredients. Others like to keep it a dark secret. Um, I'll tell you a little bit later about how to expose some of those dark secrets though. The gin distiller, you, um, will take your materials and you will have to make selections about what you use. Um, you, I hope, will look at the sensory properties of those materials. You may measure the moisture content. Uh, you may do a distillation in a little laboratory and measure the oil content. Um, you must store your botanical materials in a good, clean environment. No spurious smells. Keep it nice and cool. Um, from what I also heard today is, is that perhaps you've got to be prepared to store your botanicals and have, and have like a year's supply available. You can just imagine the risk if you buy a, a bundle and then you run out, you go and buy another bundle and it's, it comes from a different country or it comes from a different season or whatever. You know, there are risks there. So the, 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 the big scale gin distillers, they, they've got a stock of all these materials and they're prepared to blend, uh, they're produ prepared to produce a blend of their juniper and a blend of their coriander just to make sure they get that consistency. 
we obviously need to mention water. Water for um, gin distilling and water for bottling, two separate uses, uh, must be really good. Um, it's interesting, um, what do we hear today? Uh, Booth started in uh, Clark and Well. Uh, Gordon started in Goswell Road. Uh, Beefeet is in Camper Well. It's a lot of wells where gin distillers first started up. They needed good quality water. Now, currently, um, you, can bottle, you can produce gin and bottle it anywhere you like, but you've got to get good quality water. Um, so, if you're using a town water supply, um, you need to know its hardness. So you're going to measure its uh, trace metal analysis, um, and you're likely to demineralize it. Um, you might carbon filter it. You might UV irradiate it. You don't want any microbiological activity in that water. You just want H2O and nothing else. You should give that water some sensory tests. You may want to measure its pH, its conductivity, and other things. So watch the quality of your water. Gin stills are obviously very important. Uh, you know, you know, whiskey distillers always make a big uh, song and dance about <laughs> the shape of their stills and they're bashing the copper into the same shape it was on the old still and all that. And the same applies to these guys. The only, the interesting thing about gin stills is they last. Whiskey stills wear out because the whiskey things that you're distilling are slightly acidic, so they gradually wear the things out. Whereas Gin's nice and neutral, so these things go on forever. The top picture is Gordon's at Goswell Road, North London. Um, and that was the rebuild after the original distillery got bombed in the war. They then moved uh, to Essex. So that's the same stills moved to Essex. <coughs> and then about 10 years ago, they moved to Cameron Bridge in Fife, and that's the same stills from Goswell Road in London, still doing the job. I think that's quite, quite fascinating. One of the stills there is, you know, a couple of hundred years old. When you've got your gin, you've got to make sure that you're producing a consistent product. You've got to, you've got to nose it, you've got to measure alcoholic strength can draw these things consistently. And um, at the end, you've got, to, you've got to package it. What's worth noting, though, is that the neutral alcohol production can be done, and usually is done, in a different place from the gin distillation. And the gin reduction packaging can be done in a third place. This is very, very, very common. I would say it's more common that these things are separated rather than done together. And when it comes to things like Gordon's, um, gin distilled in Britain is transported often at high strength um, in big containers overseas and bottled um, in countries such as Canada and Australia. Now let's just say something about gin packaging and distribution. Um, you will see gin predominantly packaged in glass bottles. Um, in recent years, PET bottles, polyethylene terephthalate, has been used, and that's where it particularly gets used in the airline trade. You can drop, a, drop one of those bottles on a plane and not do anybody any harm. Gin is bottled in a whole range of bottle sizes. Um, obviously the small ones go very much into the airline trade. When you, when you bottle your product, um, when you produce your product anyway, you've, you've, got to be com you've got to be cognizant of regulation. We keep mentioning regulation 110 at the moment, but you need to be compliant with the regulations in Britain, if you're distilling here, and you need to be compliant with the regulations in the country where you sell. Okay, so where you make it, where you sell it. And your liquid has to be compliant, your gin. Your packaging materials have to be compliant, 
and your labeling has to be compliant. Yeah? So if you sell your gin in the United States, don't say it's 40% volume per volume, say it's 80 degrees US proof. Things like that you've got to be aware of. And uh, you'd be surprised you'd be surprised the number of things that need, need attention. For example, um, about five, eight years ago, the European Union uh, produced allergen labeling regulations, which said um, that if, you, if your product um, is made from a whole range of materials, um, wheat and barley were two examples, nuts were another example, then you had to put allergen labeling on the product. Okay, so those of you that are making your um, your gins from grain neutral spirit, are you putting allergen labeling on your gin? No. <laughs> and that's all right, don't worry about it, because it was at that point that the industry came together and demonstrated to the European Union uh, that distillates do not contain allergens. The allergenic material is so big, the molecules are so big that they don't distill, so they're not there. It's the distillation process that eliminates them. So that was a, a good example of where we as an industry, we came together and we got, an, we got a, an exemption written in European law saying that distillates from um, cereals, from nuts and from whey, um, because obviously cereals, gluten, uh, nuts, nuts, whey, milk, um, were all allergenic, listed allergenic materials. But our industry was not 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 um, a part of that so that in terms of labeling is is, is 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 important you may also have to use bottles that are prescribed <coughs> quantities so if you want to bottle here i'm sure you assume you all know that you would not produce a 750 ml gin bottle for the uk or european market you would produce a 70 centiliter bottle or a liter bottle because they are the prescribed quantities uh, for distilled spirits. You'll be careful that the materials you use for your closures, you may have aluminium or you may have plastic closures. If you're sending your gin to some of the um, more dodgy parts of the world, you may want to put um, non-refillable valves onto your bottles to stop them getting refilled. So let me give you a little insight into science within the labs. Sensory analysis, obviously, you're all partaking in that. You must have your own methodology for that sensory work. Many labs like to dilute the sample from bottle strength, say 40%, dilute it down to 20, cover it with a watch glass, let it stand for 15 minutes, and then nose it. That allows all the volatiles, all those terpenes and terpineols that Paul was telling you about this morning, to come to the surface. But you've got to develop, develop your own mechanism for doing this. <clears throat> You've got to measure alcoholic strength, and you must all measure that very precisely for excise purposes, or else you'll be chased by HM Revenue and Customs. Um, and you need the right equipment to do that. Um, hydrometry, pycnometry, or precision density meters. I won't go into that now, but we can talk about it separately later if you want. And you've got to hit the precise strength that you're choosing for your product. Mustn't be less than 37.5, but as you know, a lot of them are much stronger. Must make mention about gas chromatography. This is a technique that allows us to look at the individual components that are in a gin sample. It lets us look at each compound, which I'll call the, the congener, and it allows us to determine the concentration of it. So you'll hear about gas chromatography as soon as you get into the science of the distilling industry and the word congener. It's used in two areas. It's used first to check out the quality of the neutral alcohol that's produced and that the concentrations of those congeners are as low as possible. And we end up with a, a, a chromatogram that looks like that. And if we were looking at whiskey, for example, there'd be loads of peaks here. But because we're, because we're producing neutral alcohol, we want no peaks there. <coughs> 
We just want the big peak here, which is the ethanol peak. And we can do a second type of gas chromatography called capillary column gas chromatography, and we can look at the gin botanical congeners. The terpenes, the terpineols, and the sesquiterpenes that Paul was describing this morning. And that gives us the botanical chromatogram. Don't take notes here, but the uh, top one is a lab distillate of juniper. The second one is a lab distillate of coriander. And the third one, if I remember right, is Booth's gin. So, um, what you can see, what you would be able to see if you started dissecting this, is that it's possible to look at this and spot the components, for example, that come from juniper or come from coriander, or that one happens to come from cassia. So, you end up with a nice, unique fingerprint for um, each botanical ingredient. And if you're lucky, you end up with a, botan a botanical fingerprint for each brand of gin. Let's just look at the, the gins, the big gins now. This is last year's um, ranking of gins in the world's top 100 distilled spirits. Okay, so here's the one, Ginebra San Miguel, which none of us have heard of sells 23 million cases in the Philippines alone. It's bonkers. <laughs> but in terms of our world, the Western world, the biggest selling uh, London gin is Gordon's, and then Bombay, Seagram's, Beefeet, Tanqueray, and Carew's. Some of them are global brands, but then some of them are very much regional brands. That would be an Indian one. That would be a North American one. And the top one's a Philippines one. And the rest are international brands. All the analysis that I've described earlier can come useful when one wants to do work on the authenticity of gin. Uh, one is asked occasionally whether a sample is in fact gin. Is this liquid in this bottle gin? And it's there that one would do a generic authenticity analysis and look for the components that are associated with juniper. One also might say, is this sample in the bottle really Gordon's or Beef Eater? And then you do a brand authenticity analysis. And that becomes an issue. Um, it may be a counterfeiting issue where someone is really just counterfeiting the whole thing. But what is of interest to you, and particularly in the UK market, is on-trade substitution. Products like the big sellers, as you know, they'll be in all bars throughout the country. There is a scam where an empty bottle might get refilled in the bar by an, a cheaper, inferior product. And that is what is called on-trade substitution. <laughs> the brand owners don't like that. Obviously, they lose business. And fortunately, trading standards officers don't like it because it's against the consumer's interest. So um, work is done to check that what is sold in a pub is what it says on the label. Okay, Brand authenticity analysis. And that chromatographic analysis that I described a minute ago plays a part in that. And also authenticity indicators that various brand owners have developed in order to prove the authenticity of their brand. And uh, there's an example of um, a piece of um, uh, brand authenticity work uh, where, where one is comparing two different brands and you can clearly see that those two pictures, sorry, so you can clearly see, I can clearly see because I've spent half my life looking at these pictures, but you can see that these two Two, two, two fingerprints are quite different. So that gives you um, an insight in terms of what quality management means um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a large uh, gin production operation. Um, if you want to read more, here's a few uh, references, um, and you can pick them up off my, my own website, which is alotscientific.com. So 
Thank you very much.